Just a few seconds. Okay. Welcome, uh, uh, everybody, for uh, this uh, um, day of uh, lectures. So uh, we'll uh, um, start today with uh, uh, the first lecture by Amos Maritan, who I have the pleasure to introduce. Uh, Amos Maritan is a professor at the, um, uh, the physics department of the uh, University of Padova. And uh, his uh, research interests are very broad and he had important contributions uh, in several um, topics of quantitative biology from um, the, the theory of uh, biopolymers to uh, uh, ecology. And uh, in uh, uh, this uh, lecture, he's gonna talk about scaling uh, in ecology and the relation between metabolic theory and uh, community pathways. So before uh, Amos starts with the presentation, just a few reminders on how to ask questions. So if you are watching from YouTube, you can post your question in the chat. If you are connected in Zoom, you can either write the question in the chat or uh, use the raise and uh, tool uh, of uh, Zoom. So thank you, Amos, for being with us. And uh, please start when you are ready. Thank you, Jacopo, for uh, the, the introduction. So this is the first lecture of a series of three. The first is delivered by me, by myself. The second will be delivered by uh, Samir Subais, uh, and the third by Sandro Zaire. I think that the order is, uh, should be correct. Of course, there are, <clears throat> what I will be telling you uh, is the result of a long collaboration. And uh, there is a list, a partial list of, uh, at least of the ones that have contributed more uh, to the ideas that I will tell you today. <clears throat> and in particular, Chayan Banova, which is just one of my first collaborators, uh, and then uh, Andrea Rinaldo also that uh, was uh, lecturing uh, in, the, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this series of lectures, and Stephen Abel that uh, was introducing us uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the ecology of, uh, of forests uh, that uh, will be, most uh, of this lecture will be devoted to them. <clears throat> so, in, uh, in the last 40 years, uh, there's been a lot of data from bacteria to forest about uh, in, in, uh, in ecology. And uh, that at least there are two mainstream uh, approaches to them. One, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, there is an, a mistake here. This is a model dependent approach on the left, a model independent approach on the, on the right. So the model dependent approach on, in, in the left uh, includes a neutral theory, which uh, something will be said by Sandro Zaele about this uh, in uh, the third lecture, <coughs> and the resource competition model, uh, which will be the subject of the second lecture. Then there are lot of Volterra equation, kind of equation, <coughs> that uh, I think uh, that Stefano Alesina has uh, illuminated you on this, uh, on this issue. And then the, on the right, there is the model independent approach, which includes uh, the scaling, uh, scaling approach that will be illustrated uh, in this lecture. And all of this uh, should, uh, uh, should uh, <coughs> converge to some model that uh, contains uh, the scaling uh, embedded in, the, in, uh, in them in order to be able to reproduce the known results in, in, in all ecosystems let's say, on the, on the most important ecosystem of uh, interest, uh, and of course, uh, to be able to, to be also predictive and not just the descriptive. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the first thing that I need uh, to be sure that uh, uh, you, you, you are aware of uh, is, uh, what is uh, what are power law and how <clears throat> uh, there are deviation from them uh, in order not to be uh, confused about them. So, <clears throat> One example that most of you should know, it is the problem of uh, diffusion, for example, in 1D. And so you have a particle that diffuses in 1D, it can move uh, <coughs> in a symmetric way, both to the right and uh, to the left. 
And so the, uh, the, the, the probability to be at some position X at time T is given by a Gaussian <coughs> with the variance that is proportional to the time. And so if you set X equals zero and you ask what is the probability to be at the origin at time T, this is just a power law. And so in 1D, it is a T to the minus one half, and then a due <coughs> to uh, dimensional reason, there is also the diffusion constant that appear in the denominator to the power one half, which gives uh, the correct dimension to the probability, which, uh, which is one over a length, because it is a probability density in 1D. So if we plot uh, this, uh, this function in a linear linear plot, uh, we get uh, the, 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 the plot in the left, uh, which is uh, like a similar to an hyperbola. But in order to visualize better the power law, it is uh, convenient uh, to plot uh, the logarithm of p versus the logarithm of t. And so if we plot the log of p versus log of t, we get a straight line uh, with slope uh, minus one half. So this is uh, the one on the right is the best way to visualize uh, when a power law is present in our problem. <coughs> So typically, <clears throat> what we find is not a pure power law like this, but a power law that are a little bit, uh, let's say, dirty or truncated. And the truncation can, uh, the reason for the truncation can be uh, at least there are two kinds of truncation. One, it is because uh, in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the in the problem, uh, it has been introduced a new time, a new time scale. In the previous, uh, there was no time scale. You see that the only the only time scale is just the time, and, uh, and uh, there is no characteristic time scale in the problem, and this is why we see a pure power law. If, for example, in the, in the random walk, <coughs> the diffusion problem, uh, there is an external field that tries to, to push uh, the, the, the particle more to the, la to the right than to the left, <coughs> then uh, there is a time scale in the problem that enters through a sort of average velocity, which is uh, tau, which is uh, uh, 4D, the diffusion constant, time V square, where V square is a sort of average velocity, and so this is the right dimension of time. And so the previous law is corrected by an exponential. So for time much less than tau, we, we see the previous power law with slope minus one alpha, which is just the prefactor. Whereas for time of order of tau much larger than tau, we see that uh, the, the power law is ruined uh, due to a fast decay towards zero. <clears throat> and uh, where uh, the crossover from pure power law to a truncated power law occur is just uh, the characteristic time scale that has been introduced thanks to the external field. So other reason for having truncated the power law is uh, that uh, the system is finite, for example. <clears throat> so if we have... <clears throat> that the particle is contained in some uh, in, in, a, in a fixed uh, region, in a compact region, then there are correction due to the finite size of the system. And uh, these are the ones that will be uh, encountering uh, in, in, a, in, a, in this lecture. <clears throat> so there is a problem about the previous two slides where you are encouraged to solve, uh, to solve it. Uh, it starts from uh, uh, just to describing uh, the movement of a particle in terms of discrete time and spatial steps. And uh, in order to be, uh, to be led to the diffusion equation in, 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 one, in, in one D, which is 0.5, and then its solution through the Fourier transform, which is the, la the, the, the last but one line, where you see that if we set X equal zero, we get exactly what I said in the previous slide about uh, the, the, the truncated power law. <clears throat> so even without knowing anything about uh, the exact solution of, of the diffusion problem in 1D, you could have argued <coughs> something uh, based uh, on, uh, on, uh, on scaling argument. Uh, the scaling argument works uh, as, uh, as this slide show. So if we have to calculate uh, the probability density to be at position x at time t, given that there is a diffusion constant D <coughs> and there is no bias, no external field at the moment, the diffusion constant <coughs> has a dimension of length squared divided by time <coughs> because it describes how the variance of, of the position varies with time. It is that D times time, and so D has the dimension of length squared divided by time. So since P, P X of T in D dimension must have the dimension of one over a volume, <coughs> the, 
one way to construct the dimension of volume is just uh, multiplying the time by d and uh, taking the power minus d half. And this, and this puts the correct dimension of p. And then we must have a function which has to be dimensionless. And so the only dimension and constant is this just, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, only, yeah, the only dimension and constant is just x squared divided by dt. <clears throat> and so this is the dimensional, dimensionless ratio. So without knowing the solution of the, of the, of the problem, we just, uh, just due to a scaling argument, we can predict that uh, the, so the solution must have this form, where f is some suitable function that guarantees, of course, that uh, the probability is also normalized. So in particular, if you set uh, x equals 0, f becomes a constant in that case, and we get the answer that we, we asked before. The probability to be at the origin at time t <coughs> scale like a t to the minus d half. So in one, in one d, it is minus one half, like we were saying before. In the case that we have a, an external field in the problem, and so meaning that we have an average velocity entering the problem, then we have another time scale through the velocity and the diffusion constant that I showed you before. That, that, uh, and so that the new time scale is introduced tau. And so this p of t now can have an extra function an extra dependence of, on time uh, through a function and the, the dimensionless ratio, which is f over t. So in the, pre, in the case of the diffusion in the, that I showed before, uh, this function f is an exponential. The scaling argument typically is unable to determine what the small f is. Okay, and so you must have some other information on the system in order to calculate it. The only thing that uh, the, the scaling argument can tell you is about uh, how the scaling function has to be uh, behaves for small or large argument. So for small argument, meaning when tau is much larger than, than t, then we, we want that uh, there is a pure power, power law scaling, and so the function has to tend to a constant. Otherwise, uh, when t is much larger than tau, we want that this is a truncated power law, and so it goes to zero. <clears throat> Any question at this point? This is just the preamble. There is no question uh, in the chat, but if anyone wants to ask a question, please uh, either type it or uh, raise hand using the Zoom feature. Um, I think uh, you can move on. I'll okay. tell you if there is any question. Okay. <clears throat> One, uh, an, an important concept that will pervade the rest of, of this lecture is uh, the buzzer metabolic rate b. <clears throat> so we are uh, mammals uh, and uh, we are uh, in uh, thermal engine that we are using energy just uh, through the food, the air, the, the air that uh, we, we breathe and so on, and uh, we dissipate energy. And so the dissipated energy is proportional to the energy that we consume. And so this is called uh, the basal metabolic rate that uh, has to be distinguished but what it is called, for example, field metabolic rate, which is uh, uh, what happens when uh, you are uh, running uh, or doing uh, some, uh, some movement. Whereas the basal one is uh, more or less when you are almost sleeping. For plants, uh, it is the amount of water that is evapotranspirated per, uh, per day, for example. So a plant of uh, 20 meters uh, height, it can, uh, it can evapotranspirate uh, about 200 liters per day in, uh, in good condition. And so that, that, uh, the amount of water evaporated for per day is just a measure of uh, the metabolic rate of a plant. <clears throat> so the metabolic rate, uh, in principle, uh, can depend uh, on many details on, uh, on the physiology, on the specific physiology of the organism be an insect, a mammal, a bird, a fish, or, or whatever, or a plant. So it, can, it, came, it comes like a surprise that uh, the, the main trend of the metabolic rate doesn't depend too much on physiological details apart from some particular case, but it, it seems to depend mostly on the body mass of the organism, being it a plant or, a, or an animal or a bird or whatever. So for example, if we concentrate for a moment in, in mammals, we dissipate energy through the skin. <clears throat> and so you might think that uh, the, uh, the dissipated heat then is proportional to the, to the, to the surface area of, uh, of the skin. Meaning that uh, if, uh, since we are more or less a compact object, 
the surface scale like the volume of, uh, of the organism to the power two third, exactly like a sphere as a, re as a, as a, as a surface that scale like uh, the radius square and the volume like uh, the radius cube. So it means that the surface of the, of the sphere scale like the volume to the two third. So since the mass of a mammal is proportional to the volume through the density of the body, and the density is more or less the one of the water, the mass is proportional to the volume. So it means then that if we, if we take the, that B is proportional to the surface, the, the, the mass is proportional to the, to the volume, and the surface is related to the volume to the power two thirds, we deduce that, we should deduce it, that the metabolic rate scale like the mass to the two thirds. However, in, uh, in, uh, at the end of 40s, 1940s, uh, Mr. Kleiber, Kleiber found that uh, the two thirds should be three quarters. And indeed, uh, in his original plot, uh, you see the nice picture on, of Kleiber, Max Kleiber in, on, on the right. He was plotting the heat production per day in kilocalories, again in the log log plot, uh, as I was teaching you before, versus the log of the mass. So if uh, he's right, uh, he should find uh, that uh, the log of the mass versus the log of the, of the body mass, the, sorry, the log of the, of the metabolic rate versus the log of the, bo of the body mass should be a straight line of a slope, a three quarter, which is the red line. And you see that here there are rat, rabbit, dog, <coughs> woman, I don't know why not men, but it doesn't matter, cow, elephant, whale, this is the whale is just the green point uh, on the top and uh, the red line has a uh, slope which is three quarter the 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 upper dash line it is just uh, the 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 weight so if you plot the weight versus the weight it should be a line with a slope one so the upper line has a slope one the the lower dash line is the surface and the surface indeed scale like two thirds so according to him, the red line is in the middle and it is well approximated by three quarter. Anyway, after 71 here, <coughs> Brown, the, the one in, 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 the, in the first references on the, on, the, on the right bottom, they were calculating again the, the masses and the metabolic rate corrected with the temperature. Also there's some temperature correction that has to enter in, in, this, uh, in this law in order to make it uh, a little bit better, you see that uh, the, the log on, uh, it is log of B like before, it is not uh, very visible. It is the log of B versus the log of mass. It doesn't matter the, in, uh, in, uh, if the mass is in gram or in kilograms so because uh, that is just a, a constant that uh, is added to, to the log. <coughs> so, it is independent on which unit you are using. The power law does depend on the units. And the log is in base, in natural base. Otherwise, uh, here there are too many order. Anyway, in log 10, it is about uh, 18 order, one eight. And the slope is uh, well approximated by three quarter. And here there are, you, you see plants, mammal, bird, bat, zooplankton, insect, fish. <coughs> And you see that uh, apart from some local deviation that you can see sometime, but overall uh, the, the trend, uh, it is well captured by the three quarter, like uh, I was saying. So one might ask uh, why this three quarter is important. Uh, what is the impact of this law on our life? <clears throat> so this is uh, something that I will, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, again a small problem, uh, but it is, uh, it is done in detail. So the metabolic rate of an organism <coughs> can be attributed to the maintenance of, of, uh, of the cell. So if you have in your body NC cell at time T, each cell is consuming BC as a unit of energy. So the metabolic rate, the energy that the input of the energy input in our body, there is a part that is used by cell and the number of cells is NC. And the, and the part is used to change to, to the number of cells, meaning doing a new cell, which is the last part. In order to do a new cell, you need EC of energy. 
So the, the net balance is that the, the maintenance pew, the user for, 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 for doing a new cell, overall, it is the total input of energy. <clears throat> so the number of cells is proportional to the mass, okay? MC is the mass of the cell. The mass of the cell doesn't change with age. It is the same at all ages. And so we can transform this equation in an equation for M and using that uh, the metabolic rate scale with the mass to some power. And uh, we, we set the constant uh, in such a way that it has the, the correct unit. So V0 and MC, MC is the mass of the cell. So we scale the mass M over MC is the number of cells. B0 is some constant in order to, to fix the, 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 the right dimension. And alpha can be taken three quarter if we believe in the Kleiber law. So this, this equation is transforming this one, where uh, the first term comes from the maintain, from the, from the, uh, from, uh, sorry, the second term, it is from the maintenance. And the, and the second term, the, the first term, it is from M alpha, it is the Kleiber's law. And this is a dm over dt. So we get this equation. So if we make a small change of variables and we introduce a dimensionless variable, which is M over capital M, where M, capital M is the adult mass, we can transform the, 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 the equation for the growth in, in equation one. And so after we change the variable in terms of dimensionless variables and in terms of a characteristic time, which is this, okay, the red part, we get an equation for X, which is a very simple to integrate and this, and this gives uh, equation three. So then at the end, uh, we find that the mass of an organism should increase uh, like uh, equation four uh, is indicating. <coughs> well, you see that, uh, I think that there is a minus sign in the exponential, otherwise uh, we, we, it becomes, uh, it grows to infinity, it's not right. So there is a minus sign in front of the, of the exponent and there is e to the minus t over tau critical, tau characteristic. And the tau characteristic, it is the mass to the minus one minus alpha. So if alpha is three quarter, it is m to the one quarter. So solving the equation for growth of an organism automatically tells us that there is a characteristic, a characteristic time in our, in, in, in our organism that that scale like the mass to the one quarter. So not only that, <laughs> but what we get, it is how the organism should increase their mass as time, uh, as time increases. So if you plot everything in terms of, uh, <clears throat> oh no, sorry, in terms of, uh, of time that is scaled in this way, the time is t tau, sorry, t minus tau, tau characteristic divided by this log and we take into account the mass at birth. So all organism plotted the, the, the mass of the, of the all organism with respect to the, to the mass of the adult in terms of this rescale time, okay, in this dimensional time, they should collapse in a single, in a single curve. So here, we, for example, we have the fit of how the mass of a cow should grow. Here, how the mass of a guppy should, and you see that the, the, the data that are the, the green light, the green point, I think, uh, the, yes, the green and the empirical are well fitted by the curve, by the, 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 the prediction, both with alpha two third and also with alpha three quarter. The difference is very, is very light. <clears throat> and, uh, and so each, each organism has its own ontogenic uh, growth. But if you plot everything in terms of the dimensionless time, this time here that I've written here, and the, the ratio of the mass, the, 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 the actual mass divided the mass when they are adult, you see that the whole curve collapse in a single curve. So you see that here there are point from many animals, pig, shrew, rabbit, cow, rat, and so on, and that they all follow a universal curve. So we are, member of the same family, meaning that uh, it's not, uh, we're not too different uh, from a lizard or from a pig in terms of growth, uh, if we choose a suitable scale time and the scaled mass, meaning we measure the mass with respect to the adult mass and the time has to be rescaled according to the mass to the one quarter. For example, the lifespan grows like mass to the one quarter. So a small animals like a rat, this much less than an elephant. 
also the 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 the, the, the half a bit uh, scale like the mass to the minus one quarter. So as a, a rabbit has a, a, a frequency a, half, a frequency which is uh, much higher than one of an elephant, and so there are many consequences of this. And then uh, you can find them uh, in the original paper by us and by West, Brown, and, and Mist. <clears throat> so here now we concentrate uh, on the origin of this one quarter, because there is this uh, M to the one quarter, the, the metabolic rate scale like the mass to the three quarter. And so it is called the quarter power law scale. Are there questions at this point before I go on? So not in the chat, but uh, uh, I'm I can go. Yeah, there is a question. Um, uh, where in this plot? Uh, uh, ah, so in this plot, where in this plot fall species in which uh, individual is hard to define? This is uncommon for animals, but very common in plants. So, sorry, what is the question? <laughs> I it's, it's uh, very well. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't know if Miguel wants to uh, ask him, uh, ask uh, the question. Yeah, yes, go ahead. yes, of course. So um, here it's uh, it's fundamental to define an, an individual so you can measure mass, the, the growth of that of that individual. Yes. So where, where would the organisms where individual is hard to define, like uh, this, uh, I don't know, large prairies of uh, grass where all the grass blades are connected or? or... Uh, I'm not sure that I understand the question. This individual, I think they are grown, they, they are grown in, in some, all in the same condition. Meaning that they are, uh, I think they are feeded uh, regularly. And uh, the, the point on this graph, I think it averages over many individuals of the same kind. Is right. but. But the, the, the definition of the, the, the rescaling of the mass depends on the mass of the adult. Oh, yes, or yes, exactly. The average yeah. mass of an adult. Exactly. If, yes. if we have something like in plants, for example, where they can basically continue to grow indefinitely. Uh, oh, yes. That's so that is a question of how to define the mass of a plant. We come right. back. I, I think I will come back later to that. You're okay. right. For plants, you should one should distinguish between uh, the dead the dead mass uh, and the living mass. You are right. Oh, okay. Okay. So this uh, here, uh, uh, as you I don't know if you can read that uh, there is uh, no plants uh, in this plot. Uh, right. But you are <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we will concentrate uh, on the possible origin of this quarter power law. And uh, so many years ago, we had. Uh, some uh, in, uh, intuition on, on uh, why or where this three quarter comes from. And so we were uh, hypothesizing that uh, this could be the result of an optimization principle. And so we said that uh, for a given metabolic rate, uh, evolution uh, has been such that, uh, that it's uh, it selected the animals or organism whose mass is uh, the minimum as possible for a given metabolic rate. <laughs> or if you want, uh, for a given mass, you want the maximum metabolic rate as possible, which is uh, like to say that uh, if the metabolic rate of a restaurant is the number of meals served per day, and the mass is uh, formed by the number of waiters, you want to have the minimum number of waiters for the given number of, me of meals that you serve every day. So this is, for example, the problem of serving an, a, a village or a town with water and you ask uh, how much water do we want to, to have in the pipes that uh, is, are able to, to fulfill the, the, the need of the town. So if you have, uh, if you have pipes that, that goes around in, in, uh, in, a, in a way like showing the figure like in a spiral, for example, uh, for these nine houses, uh, each house consume one unit of water per day. So from the main source, uh, we must have that uh, nine, lit nine unit of water has to leave the the, the main source uh, every day, the pipe enter in the first house, cons one, one unit is consumed, out eight uh, units are, are going out from the first house and so on. So overall in the pipes uh, you have eight plus seven plus six. Uh, and overall uh, you have 
that uh, while the metabolic rate is nine, which is nine unit of water per day, the total mass is the total mass present in the pipes. And so if you sum nine plus eight plus so, what you get, it is uh, approximately L to the four. If L by L is the, the, the size of the town, L square is the metabolic rate, the number of units of water consumed per day, whereas L to the four is the total water present on, on the pipes or the number of waiters that are going around in the tables. And so if you put the two things together, what you have is that the mass scale like the metabolic rate to the square. <clears throat> so we can do better if, we, for example, we choose uh, uh, that uh, the, the distribution network is uh, um, uh, ramified, it is a tree. A direct tree meaning that uh, the, the row, the, the arrow are not going back, but they are only going uh, in the direction uh, away from the source. So again, if you count how much water is in the pipe, instead of the L to the four, you know, you find L to the three. And so the, the exponent relating the mass to the metabolic rate is three half. So it means that in 3D, we get the three four, because if we do again the same, the same trick as before, what you find is that the, the metabolic rate scale like the mass to the power D, the dimension of the system, divide D plus one, so in 3D is three quarter. So this seems a very nice a magic theorem that can be proved exactly. <clears throat> that not, not everything is understood perfectly, but at least it gives an idea that this three quarter may be the result of an optimization principle. For plants, the things is even a little, it is even simpler. So forest, it's for sure, it is one of the most exciting ecosystems because due to their complexity. <clears throat> and the, and the, the structure of the forest is also related to the forest functionality. By forest structure, I mean the distribution of sizes of trees in a forest. <clears throat> so in the, in the last 40 years, there have been several uh, measurements, several census of forest around the world and uh, typically what they do is uh, they measure, which is the, which is, uh, the, the easier thing, uh, the, the, the diameter of the trunk at, the, at, some, at some height, and then they, they, <coughs> they measure the diameter through uh, just uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, ribbon-like meter. <coughs> and uh, the, the distribution of the diameter, the, the probability to find the fraction of, uh, of trees with a given diameter, is plotted here. This is again a log log plot. This is the log of uh, individuals, meaning plants, uh, having a given radius, uh, trunk radius uh, at the breast height. So in the in the in the horizontal axis you have the log of the of the diameter. In the vertical axis you have the num the log of the number of individuals. Of course, uh, this has fruitable binned. And you see that uh, more or less in in uh, in uh, there is one decade, a little bit more than one decade, there is a power law with an exponent which is around minus two. And you see that uh, this is uh, true for uh, various kind of forest here, we are just showing four, later on we show more of them. <clears throat> and there is, a, there is some truncation, meaning that you can find trees uh, with sizes uh, that are too, too big. <clears throat> A, you can also measure another trait of the plant beside the, 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 the trunk radius. You can also measure the, the volume of the crown. So again, if we plot the log of the crown volume versus the log of the height, okay, we see that uh, there is this cloud of point that more or less stay, there is a, this, uh, there's not been a, no attempt to make an average uh, and just plot also the, the, the error on the average and so on. Just the, these are the raw data, plot in a log-log plot as before. What you see is that uh, the, the crown volume grows like uh, approximately the cube of the height of the tree. So you, you, might, uh, you might think uh, that uh, you, you, you would expect that uh, it is more or less uh, something like uh, a very compact uh, cube and, uh, and spherical object, uh, but uh, this is not true because uh, as you, so the, uh, just uh, I need another slide. You can define an exponent uh, that says in principle, how the, the crown 
radius scale with the height of the tree. And so this is uh, typically described by an exponent that is called the half exponent. <clears throat> so this uh, half exponent for, uh, for, the, for uh, this slide, it is one, as I will show in a moment. But before showing that, let me show what happens at various latitudes. This exponent that around the tropics is around one, as you go toward the uh, more northern latitude, it, uh, it uh, decay toward 0.5, okay? So it's not true that plants are always uh, like spherical object like uh, in, this, in this picture, but uh, as you go to more and more, more to the north, uh, they become shorter in, in height, but also much thinner. So here at the tropics, uh, the, the, it is almost an isotropic scaling of the width and the height. Whereas as you move to the northern, the height scale much faster than, than the width of, of, of the crown. This just means that they are taller. Indeed, they are shorter in height, but the width of, of, of the crown scale with an exponent which is smaller than one. <clears throat> So now let's see what are the, the, the impact of, uh, of, of this scaling. And, uh, and, uh, and be before that, we can, we can derive how the metabolic rate of a plant scale with uh, the plant mass. And so we can come to, the, to what is meant by mass of a plant, at least for me. <clears throat> so we have that plants are uh, taking water from, from, this, from underground and, and through silence that are not cylindrical, but almost cylindrical uh, conduit, they, they are transported to the, to the leaves and through stoma, they are uh, evapotranspirated in, 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 in the air. <coughs> and so the, if, the, if the leaf density of the crown is more or less constant, and if the leaf is an invariant unit, meaning that uh, they are not changing with the age of, of the tree, which is true. If I give you a, a leaf of a tree, you can't say if the tree is uh, one year old or a hundred or thousand year old. It is always the same. <clears throat> Based on that, if the tree volume, if uh, the, the, sorry, if the crown scale like the height to the capital H, then you can calculate what is the volume of the crown. So it is H times h to the power, h, sorry, the r crown square, which means h to the 2a capital H, meaning that the crown volume scale like the height of the tree to an exponent, which is one plus two h. So as I said before, the capital H is about one around the tropics. And so it makes the crown of the, of the, vol of, uh, the volume crown to be, to scale like more or less three around the tropics and then at the, at the most northern latitude, this scale like two, because H, capital H, becomes about one half. So we go from H cubed near the tropics to H square to the north. And uh, if the leaf density is more or less constant, we can deduce, since the, 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 the evapotranspiration is proportional to the surface of the leaves, the number of leaves is proportional to the, to the volume. So we have that the metabolic rate of the tree is related to the volume of the crown, which is the height of the tree to the power one plus two H, capital H. Now you can also measure the mass of the water inside the tree, okay? And the mass of the water inside the tree is proportional to the, to the, to the, to what is called the subwood, the, the living part of the wood, which is just the, the, the say the external part of, uh, of the trunk, meaning the water is flowing uh, only through the, 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 the external part of the trunk. Not, this is not, not necessarily, it is not strictly true for all plants. For example, at the tropics, all the wood is more or less living. And so all, all trunk uh, is uh, conducting, conducting water. Whereas uh, where there is uh, the seasons uh, at our latitude is only the external part that is more conductive uh, the internal one is dead. And so we have the water is flowing only near the, the surface of the trunk. And so we have, what we mean by mass of a tree is uh, the, 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 the water present in, in, in the tree, or if you want, the living, the living wood, not the dead part. <clears throat> 
So you can do a, a, a short, a simple calculation to, to see that uh, the amount of water present, uh, it is uh, the metabolic rate times age. Just calculating how much water is uh, contained in the xylem, given that the surface of the, of the tip of the xylem can be identified with the stoma of the lip, which we have already calculated the surface. And so you can calculate that the total mass, the total water present on, 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 on a plant is proportional to height of the tree to the power two plus two h. So if we, if we use that, b is proportional to h to the one plus two capital h, and the mass is as an extra power of h, you can put everything together and you find the generalization of the Kleiber's law in terms of the last exponent. And so you see that when capital H is one, you find the three quarter. So for plants near the tropics, we should have that the metabolic rate scale like the living part of the wood or the total water present in the plants to the power three quarter. Whereas away from the tropics, this exponent uh, becomes smaller till it reaches two thirds toward the, the, the north. <clears throat> so you can also express the metabolic rate if all the, 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 the cross section of the trunk transport water, or a fraction of it at, at least, then we can also express the, the metabolic rate as the water flow times the cross section, which is approximately pi r square. <clears throat> And uh, uh, the water density, of course, does depend on the size of the tree. At the end, what you find is that the metabolic rate is also proportional to the cross section of the trunk at the base. Okay. <clears throat> so if we use that, at the end, you can get this nice table where you can express the metabolic rate as the height to the one plus two capital H or to R square. Or if you use these two relations, you can express the radius of the trunk in terms of the R. I, the height of the tree. So you see that when H is one, you get that the radius of the trunk grows like super linearly with the height. You might observe that the, 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 the trunk radius is much smaller than the height of the tree. That is true. I'm not saying the opposite, but uh, it means that here in front, there must be an amplitude that is very small. So the amplitude is not the concern of, of, of the scaling theory, at least at this level, but it is an important issue because that is related to what is the maximum height of a tree, okay? Because we don't see trees of, of that are half a kilometer height, but mostly are 100 meter height, and that is an open issue. Nobody knows why trees stop to, have, to, to grow in height, but they can grow in mass, as one of your colleagues was saying before. The mass of a tree is always growing, because there is a part that is dead, that is, uh, that is just a the, the, the sustain, the, the, it's just the physical support of the plant. The radius of the crown scale like uh, in this way, okay, just using the, the, the scaling of H and R, the mass of the tree, if uh, it is more or less concentrated on, on trunk and branch scale like H times R square, meaning the, more or less the mass of the trunk. And so you can find that the mass of a tree scale like uh, at the tropics scale like h to the four. So the volume scale like h cube, as I said before, the mass scale like h to the four. So then it means that the density of the wood scale like h cube, sorry, h four divide h cube, meaning that the density of the, of the, of the wood of a plant grows like h. So you can imagine that this density cannot grow forever because at a certain point, branches sta started to collapse one on the other, and there's no more room for, the, for, the, for, tree, for, for leaves. And so there's no more room for evapotranspiration. So this uh, constraint is telling you that uh, at a certain point, it must stop. Okay? In order to evaluate the, where this can occur, we should know what are the constant in front uh, of this power law. That has to be there also for dimensional reason. <clears throat> so now we can also, use uh, this, uh, this geometrical traits uh, to understand uh, what happens uh, for an assembly of plant or for, let's say, for forest. Any question at this point? There are not uh, questions in the chat. Um, 
Let's go on. I can. Yeah, I think we can go on and then I put like first time. Okay. End. I. Okay. There is a question. Uh, yeah, perhaps there is a question. Uh, yeah, I I I have a question. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask. Uh, you showed before. Uh, that the, there, there is this uh, paper that uh, they have found that um, the relationship of the body mass with the number of the individuals, they found the scaling exponent of minus two. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Around minus two, yes. The number of individuals of, uh, of plant with a given radius, uh, trunk radius, scale like R to the minus two. Yeah, my question is based on uh, because there is also the Damoth's rule, uh, which there is also the Damoth's rule, who also Damoth's uh, law, okay? Damoth's law, yeah, that uh, he also uh, predicts that the relationship of the body size and the abundance should scale with a minus three fourth. Yes, yeah, that is, is another. That is another problem. Uh, Damoth was uh, one of. We have collaborated, so you know what he, what he was meant. So if you take, <clears throat> if you if you if you are interested in cultivating trees and uh, and uh, and you want to know how many trees can stay on a given area, but trees of the same size, then you are right because uh, if uh, if each tree that they have all the same size, so they are all consuming the same amount of energy. And we know that each of them is consuming R square, okay? So you have to, you have to take the, the maximum number of trees of the same size times R square, which is the size, has to be equal to the amount of resources that are available. So if the amount of resources that are available is fixed, the total number of trees is R to the minus two, exactly. But uh, this exponent is related, what you are saying is related to trees that are more or less of the same size. I'm not talking of that. We are talking of the distribution of sizes, like it is observing forests, like this. I will come back to that to that problem uh, in, in a moment. Okay. So in order to understand exactly this problem, how the sizes of trees are distributed on the forest, we must uh, uh, introduce a, another optimization principle, which is that we assume that plants are trying to fill all possible room that is uh, free. Of course, uh, a fraction of it, uh, a finite fraction, is not uh, just an infinitesimal fraction, but uh, a fraction of it. So if we assume that, uh, we must have that at, uh, at, a given, at uh, any given height, uh, we must have that uh, the room, that the space is occupied by leaves. So if we say that uh, the probability to have plants of a given height, P naught of H, uh, the P0 is introduced because I want to call it ideal distribution. We know that the volume of a crown scale like small h to the power one plus two capital H. The distribution of height is P0 of H. So the total number of trees, suppose that is capital N, okay? So N times P0 of H prime times DH prime is it is just the fourth line. It is the total number of trees with height in the range between H and I, H plus DH. If we multiply this by the volume, which is H prime to the power one plus two H, and we integrate between zero and capital N, the small H, we require that this is proportional to the volume of the forest of area A, meaning this is, uh, it is filling uh, almost uniformly all uh, the, the room at disposal. And so we're saying that uh, the total volume occupied by, by, the, the, by the leaves uh, is proportional to A, the area of the forest, uh, times H. This has to be true for all H in, in the range between, uh, let's say, zero and some maximum height uh, that I've called uh, H critical. <clears throat> If I differentiate with respect to H, then what you derive from here is that the ideal distribution, it is some constant, the area of the plot divided by N, which is the, the inverse density of, 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 of plants, times H 
to the power minus one plus two capital H. The density of trees, uh, this picture is taken from the book by Hubble, uh, the neutral theory uh, of biogeography. And you see that uh, the density <coughs> is constant. The, de the density of plants uh, as the number, <coughs> as the plant, uh, as the, uh, the plot area increases, uh, you see that there is a perfect straight line with slope one. And so it means that this is, uh, this is just constant. <clears throat> and so it is just uh, the, the ideal distribution of height. Uh, it is uh, just uh, H to the exponent of the crown volume. <clears throat> so now we take into account that there is a constraint that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the, the plot has to satisfy, that the, num the resource availability is fixed. So if we take into account the resource availability, the, 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 the ideal distribution has to be modified by taking into account that we cannot have as many plants as we want. So if we take into account the, the limitation in the resource availability, we find that after we change the variable from height to radius of the trunk, we find that the distribution at the tropics, just for simplicity, it is R to the minus seven over three, and then the, the truncated power law with some characteristic radius that is related to the availability of the resources. So the minus seven over three is just the ideal distribution without taking into account the finiteness of the resources. Sorry, this is my dog. <coughs> and so the exponent is not a minus two, like a simple application of that. Dumb's law is true, but it's not, uh, it's not answering to this question of the distribution of the, of the sizes. So the exponent is 2.3. And indeed, uh, we, 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 we may, we, from the data, we, we saw that uh, the, the exponent is uh, nearer to seven over three than two. Originally, West, Enquist, and Brown did a mistake, uh, and, uh, and uh, they were saying that uh, this was minus two, and they also related to it, to Damus law, but it's not the Damus law. Of course, as we go up in the latitude, this exponent uh, changes. <clears throat> So in order to understand why the finiteness of the, of the, of the, finiteness of the, of the resource availability impact on the ideal distribution, one has to use a, a minimum principle. So we, we say that the true distribution with this P of H has to be as near as possible to the ideal one, taking into account that the total amount of resources has to be finite. So if we impose that the total number of resources has to be finite, and this is equation two, and we want to minimize the distance from, of the real distribution from the ideal one, after some calculation, we find that the distribution of height is the ideal one, which is the red here, times the exponential. So if we now do a change of variables <clears throat> with some assumption that we know that the radius of the trunk scale like the, the height of the tree in this way. We saw this in the table that I was showing before. So if we do the scale, so this, the, if, if this is a deterministic, uh, meaning that given the, the radius of the trunk, we automatically say what is the height of the tree, then we should say that uh, it is a delta of theta. This is not true because there are two random variables. Uh, so in principle, what we have to see is that uh, the probability that uh, we have a given radius of the trunk given that the height of the tree is h, a generalization of a delta of Dirac is this scaling answers. So if we use this scaling answers with the distribution of the height, the non-ideal one that we have just found in the previous slide that you can go over carefully <coughs> by yourself, you, you, we use what we found in the previous slide. We use this scaling answers, which is the number two, which is a generalization of a deterministic answers and then you do some calculation, you find what is the distribution of the radius, which is the, this power law, one plus six capital H divided one plus two H. When capital H is one, you, you find seven over three, corrected by this exponential, which is a, a Gaussian in this case, which is R divided R over RC. RC is just related to the amount of resources that are, that are uh, at disposal. So if the resources are very, very large, RC is very large. And so the exponential comes into play 
only for large radius, and you can see a beautiful power law. On the other hand, if the resources are very tiny, then RC is very small, and so the power law is masked by these corrections here. <clears throat> so we take this, uh, this, this is a constant, by the way, it is just can be fixed by normalization. So if we take the distribution for granted, and uh, we just uh, have only one uh, parameter in our problem, which is RC, because we don't, we, we, we don't have a measure of, of the source avoidability, and we measure capital H from, from the crown uh, geometry, then we, we plug it there and we can make prediction of the distribution of radius of trunk in various forests around the world. This is just a sample of nine. We have about 50 of them. So the red point are the, are the prediction based on, on the previous slide. We just uh, fit on, uh, fit in just one parameter, which is RC, and the black dots are uh, the data. And you see that uh, the, 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 the agreement with the, with the data is quite satisfactory. The data are not uh, perfect because there are census. The census are done, it's very, they are done every five years. The statistic is good, but it's not exceptional. And so you can find anyway that it is quite reasonable. So I think that in, uh, I should finish. Let me just finish. Uh, these are just a, a problem for you. Okay, uh, these are two problems for you. This uh, I can skip. <clears throat> and uh, based uh, on, the on the ideal distribution that uh, I saw, that we were, I, I was showing, uh, this ideal distribution, you can go to forest uh, and, uh, and measure how far you are from, uh, from the ideal distribution, from the prediction, let's say. So if, uh, if we have a forest uh, where there is some disturbance, uh, like uh, a road or uh, some something that is going on on some on some part near you are near you are to the to the to, to the to the disturbance which is part b if you go and measure the, the distribution of sizes in part b and in part a part a is uh, is undisturbed if it's far away and uh, the, the the dash green line it is the prediction and the, and the black line it is uh, the, the the data and you see that uh, the prediction agree with the data. On the other hand, given that the crown radius is, uh, is not disturbed by the presence of the road, we, we can measure the, the, the crown radius. We, should, we can measure the capital H exponent. We can predict what is the power law of the, of the ideal distribution. And that if, we, if we compare the ideal prediction, which is the dash line for both A and B, the dash line is the, 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 the prediction. You see that in B, the distribution of trees differ from the ideal one. Whereas in A, which is far away from the disturbance, agree with the prediction. So the scaling approach can tell us, can quantify the degrees of disturbance in a forest just going and measuring the distribution of sizes. The distribution of sizes deviate from the prediction. Based on that, you can say how wet is a forest and so you can quantify the degrees of wetness. So this is a graph, again, for various forests. And uh, the measurement was done by Silan, one of our collaborators. And you see that uh, when you are far away from the disturbance, the dash line is the ideal. And as you move toward the high disturbance, you, you see that uh, the disturbance uh, is quite visible. And uh, you, you see a large deviation from the ideal one. So this uh, this is just a cartoon. And so that, these are the main conclusions. So thank you for, uh, for your attention. And sorry, if I'm almost at the end of the hour. Thank you, Amos, for the very nice uh, lecture. So um, if you have a question, please raise uh, your hand. So in the meanwhile, there is a question actually from the chat by Jordi, who is asking a clarification on the Hearst uh, exponent. So is the, uh, its value obtained experimentally uh, or there are any physical arguments or biological arguments for its value uh, dependence on the latitude? On the latitude? Yes, so-, so yes, that, is a, this is a, that is our problem. The, this is a, what we haven't understood. Uh, there's some echo that I, I feel. So uh, I, 
So the capital H, how it changes in latitude uh, is an open problem. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, uh, West, uh, sorry, Enquist and Nicholas uh, was saying uh, that uh, <coughs> uh, forests uh, away from tropics uh, are exceptional, uh, meaning that they are exception to the power law with an ideal exponent, uh, let's say three, well, uh, for the crown volume. Whereas uh, we are saying uh, that they are obeying a different scaling. Uh, and, uh, but we haven't, uh, we, are, we are not able to, uh, to present an argument uh, to see how the, the exponent capital H change with latitude. It's just a, an empirical observation based on data. Great. Um, if there is any other question, please, uh, this is the time to ask. Okay, everything was uh, clear. So uh, the I mean the lecture will be available on on uh, on uh, on YouTube. And uh, uh, ah, there is a question by Martina. How uh, do you measure uh, RC? Can you repeat? How do you measure RC? Which uh, RC is a fit parameter. You have to. We have to fit the, the, the data because RC, I said, is related to the, where the truncation of our law occurs. And uh, in the derivation that I did, I was relating RC to the amount of uh, avoidable resources. So if the resources, uh, the, the avoidable resources are uh, huge, RC becomes uh, very high. Otherwise, uh, if the resources are very tiny, RC becomes very small. But uh, since we don't have access to the avoidable resources, we have to fit the, this parameter. Great. So there is uh, another question uh, from YouTube actually asking, uh, can you apply the same scaling concept to other uh, communities that are not uh, um, uh, plant communities? Yes, we... Um, plant are... Forest is uh, an easy community because the plants are not moving and you can measure sizes very easy, but we don't have uh, such a facility for, uh, for other communities, but we are trying to do it uh, uh, for uh, bacteria community. Uh, I think uh, that uh, Rinaldo, I don't know which lecture he has done, but uh, we were uh, doing measurement of bacteria uh, and uh, we were seeing uh, similar things also for bacteria, uh, but as with not as a good statistics as we have for, for forests. But surely it's something that should be done in the future at the same level of accuracy. Great. So uh, thank you Amos very much again for uh, giving this lecture. Um, and uh, now we are gonna take a, a 12 minute break before uh, James O'Dwyer uh, Q&A session. Um, and now we're going to be uh, randomly assigned to breakout rooms. Uh, so see you in uh, about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you again.
May I close the breakout room? Yes, please. After one minute. Um, great. So if everyone is anyone is following from uh, YouTube, uh, we are gonna start again in uh, about one minute when people are gonna join back to the main Zoom uh, meeting room. Um, so if you want to ask uh, questions, as usual, you can use the YouTube uh, chat to do that. Um, and I read the question for you. From, uh, for you. Uh, OK, so we are waiting the participants to join back. Okay, I think uh, uh, everyone should be back in the main uh, meeting room. So uh, before we start with the next next uh, um, lecture, I'd uh, uh, just I'd like to um, say a few reminder about uh, a few information about the school. So uh, please uh, remind to check uh, frequently the the uh, program on the ICTP website, especially the program of next week is uh, changing uh, rapidly. And next week, beyond uh, other lectures, we are going to also have uh, round tables uh, with the discussions among uh, speakers uh, that can also be participated by you. And uh, um, the other point I wanted to make is that next Thursday, uh, the 16th, there is going to be a colloquium, an ICTP colloquium by uh, Professor Ned Wingreen, uh, which will be live streamed on YouTube and uh, can be followed on Zoom. But for that, if you want to follow on Zoom and ask questions, you have to, since it's a separate event, you have to register. So you find all the information on the SCTP website. Great. So um, the next uh, uh, slot is a Q&A session, like the one we uh, had uh, earlier. And uh, uh, in this respect, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the next lecturer, James O'Dwyer. James is a professor in the plant biology department at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, um, his research, research is focused on modeling and analyzing complex uh, ecological community, combining data and theory. So he pre-recorded two lectures on uh, cooperation, stability, and uh, resilience. Uh, so what uh, I'm gonna do now is to leave the floor to James and uh, leave the floor to uh, you as well to ask questions. So uh, please, if you have any question about the pre-recorded lectures, uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, type it in the chat or raise hand. Okay. So we have a question by uh, Washington, please. Yeah. Hi, James. I enjoyed your lectures quite a bit. Very interesting stuff. Um, I got a bunch of questions. Maybe I'll just uh, s throw a couple of questions at you that were things you commented on that I wasn't sure I fully understood what you meant. One was, you said that um, in your models, you weren't really depending on, or it didn't really matter whether you chose a random distribution for the interactions. I mean, you had the lock of Volterra and then you also had the separate resource business. Yeah, yeah. Can you, so what, the first question is, can you say a little bit more about whether you use random interactions or what you use there? And I'll just ask the second question you can. <clears throat> and the second question is you made a comment about being able to integrate out the resources and get a generalized lock of Volterra model with some extra terms for the other things. And, yeah. and the second question is, whether the resources actually have independent trajectories, so those would be like hidden variables and some time dependencies, or whether it's something simpler than that. Yeah, super, super interesting questions. Thank you very much for the questions, Washington. Uh, so let me, uh, the first one, uh, as you probably know, and I know other lectures have, uh, lecturers have talked about it, the, many of those classic Locke Volterra results do rely on results for the eigenvalue spectra of random matrices. So that, that uh, I'm not disputing. The what, my comment there was, but it's a but it's a restriction, right? Because that that may not. It's certainly not telling you about every possible 
lock and Altera system, right? That's for sure. Um, if you fine tune the interactions, you could get uh, not any spectrum you want, but you could certainly violate those gen general rules for stability. So my comment was about uh, the consumer resource models in contrast to that. And so there are matrices obviously involved there that you saw in the lectures like in that, uh, and I think with, with the with the additional layer of mechanism, there be, there comes more choices to make. So there's there's many different versions of those consumer resource models, which is one issue. But in the version I showed in the lecture, where you have substitutable resources with some preferences for those resources, and you have um, some production or returning of resources to the common pool, there are two matrices there, right? The the C matrix and the P matrix, as I was terming them. And our results about stability, uh, there are definitely some assumptions along the way to get the strongest analytical results. We have to assume things like um, equal abundances for the different taxa, but, but we can still get a range of results weakening those kinds of assumptions. But what we don't ever have to assume is that um, the C and P matrices are typical of a random draw. So they could be literally anything you want so that, that this, for the results that we, we, we can prove. So that the C matrix could be uh, just diagonal, which is one of the cases I, I looked at in slightly more detail. So you, you'd specialize on one resource or it could be, could be random, could be some mixture of uh, specialism and then some off diagonal elements might be random. So you have some additional ability to use other resources, but it really doesn't matter. For, for the results that we looked at. So that, what I was trying to say was that, you know, it's not the whole story and there are, there are, there are some things that we, we, we don't have a handle on in that consumer resource framework. But one nice thing is that we don't have to make that assumption about the random matrices to get to, get to the, the results. The, the results about, you know, now understanding the, the structure of the whole spectrum would be another question. We don't know that, but just saying whether it's, um, stable or not, we, we can say without making those kind of assumptions. Just, just to clarify, I mean, you're not saying it's true for every possible CMP set of matrices, right? So every possible set, set of CMP matrices within some, so there are some constraints, like for example, um, they have to be positive. Um, the P matrix, the way I formulated that model was such that the diagonal was zero. So you weren't recycling into, um, you know, uh, well, in, in, the, in the case of the specialist matrix, I, I actually think maybe more generally, even the diagonal could be non-zero, but there are some constraints on the P and C matrix for it to make biological sense. Other than that, no. I see, very interesting. So you're saying it's a very general result, independent. Yeah, it's, it, in that respect, yes. That now I won't um, sort of um, say there aren't a lot of assumptions going in there because even building the structure of that model is, is making, if you like, more assumptions than Locke of Volterra. And uh, I can give you one flavor of where, where um, even though exactly as you say, that the results I presented are nicely very general. I'll give you an example of, of a flavor of something which is sort of not exactly covered up, but something that's not maybe immediately obvious. So one, uh, one assumption I made, and I did state it in the lecture, but the benefit I derive from a resource in the model I showed you is the is proportional to the rate at which I deplete that same resource. So if I'm eating something, I'm growing in proportion to that. But of course, that doesn't have to be the case. I could degrade resources without caring about them. So I could take up resources and just dump them in some form which was unusable to me or anyone else without my population growing. And that's, that's not implausible in the sense that um, you know, there are examples of something of things of cases in real but real ecological systems where that is to some extent the case maybe not as extreme as that and it also makes intuitive sense in that i could gain a competitive advantage if i just degrade the resource you use it doesn't doesn't necessarily matter to me that i can grow with it so um making that generalization uh you you, you have a different set of results that's something we haven't um published yet but but i'm working on with uh theo who's one of the grad students i mentioned um and an undergrad in my lab but um yeah so i guess what i'm trying to, to add the nuance i'm trying to add is that with the consumer resource models there are a lot of choices to make before you even get to those equations once you get there let c and p be whatever you want we, as long as they are interpretable biologically cool
uh, second question was about integrating out, right? Integrating yes. out resources. So that's a great question. Uh, it has uh, it sort of bugged me for quite a long time uh, as I started to think about ecological questions many years ago, uh, because you had things like, you, well, you had these two kind of parallel frameworks, right? Thinking about competition or interactions more generally, Locke and Volterra, and then adding that layer of mechanism. And, uh, and yeah, I'd certainly seen, and I learned more about it as I went on, seeing the statement that those, those two frameworks can be made equivalent by integrating out these additional um, degrees of freedom, the resources. So, but there, there are some subtleties there. Uh, so I, I, I wrote another paper a couple of years ago, which I didn't talk about in this talk, but trying to get at when can that be done exactly without, as you said, I think in your earlier formation of the question, the resources having their own independent trajectories or you know, being in independent degrees of freedom. And there are some cases where that's true. And you can probably guess that in those cases, there's got to be some kind of conserved quantity and that, that you know, so that the dynamics of something involving the consumers and something involving the resources turns out to have uh, no time derivative. And so in some models, that is the case. And so the simplest one, uh, the very simplest case would be um, one consumer and one resource. So th think of the resource as space. I like there's some finite space I can occupy and I'm trying to, you know, as I reproduce, my population is growing and filling out that space. So then you could divide up that, um, you know, that, that space into a space which is filled by individuals in my population and then empty space that I'm able to expand into. And you could think of the, the empty space as an available resource, right? That's sort of you know, something I can take advantage of. You know, access to light, you could think about it literally as a, a vective resource. And, uh, but, it, there's something conserved, right? Which is the total amount of space is fixed, you know, if I'm not expanding it in some way. And so you could write down a consumer resource model for one consumer and the available space, uh, but then write down that the total occupied space, which would be the consumer population density, roughly or population size, plus the available space, the resource always is fixed. Integrate out the resource that way and you end up with logistic growth. So you could start off with something which looks like it's linear growth for the consumer, but multiplied by the amount of available resource that's left, because you're going to grow more slowly if there are less patches left that you can go into. Looks linear, but you integrate out the resource because there is this conserved quantity, total space isn't changing. You get logistic growth where you, know, you saturate up to the total, the size of the field, right? Whatever it is. So that's a simple case where there's a conserved quantity, you can exactly integrate out the resource. Then there are you could write down multivariable consumer models and multiple resources, uh, but it's certainly not trivial that there's going to be anything like that, any kind of conserved quantity. So that's, uh, but there are cases where, that, where that, that's true. And in those cases, you exactly can integrate out the resources. You have an exact description in terms of um, the, the consumer population sizes. I mean, it will not in general be Locke of Volterra, but it'll be something. So, so you're that's possible. If you have as many algebraic equations as you have resources, you can basically solve for the resources and just eliminate them from the equation. Exactly, exactly. But that's rare. So that that, you know, that system is integrable in some respect, and uh, but that's not typical. But mm -hmm. there, the, the cases which are more talked about, or at least um, you know, when I first started reading about in ecology, the kind of uh, canonical way of thinking about it would be, okay, that's probably not always going to be the case, typically. Mm -hmm. that there's some exactly conserved you know, some number of exactly conserved quantities uh but that the there is a, a thought that maybe um resources would be uh, like fast moving would approach their equilibrium values quickly and mm -hmm. so in those if 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 you if you buy that idea then um the, the approach would be basically to set the, all of the dr by dt's on the left hand sides of the resource equations equal to zero and solve the other sides algebraically. That's not going to be an exact, that's not going to be exactly, um, that won't match the true numerical solution, say, of those ODEs. Uh, it, it may match it certainly close to the equ an equilibrium if you linearize the system and say there is a group of eigenvalues which is very um, uh, 
large and negative, and then a group which is very small and negative. So you'll have some so slow and fast directions. And then the full generalization of that um, result, I guess, would be something that it's very hard to get a handle on, at least, I mean, it's certainly not obvious how to get a handle on it, but you, you might think about the full dynamical system more generally. So you've got some space of consumers and resources. So like living in R to the two N, I guess, if there's N consumers and N resources, Suppose you're at some arbitrary point in this space, so you're not near equilibrium, and you want to know, could, could I approximate this by, you know, just a model of consumers? I think that's in very, very much in general not going to be true. But what you could imagine is quite plausible is that maybe quite quickly the dynamics relax to a slow manifold and then kind of cruise in on that lower dimensional manifold to the equilibrium. Now that manifold is in general going to be some nonlinear shape, presumably, because you're not linearized, obviously, near, and even if you were linearizing the equilibrium, it could still be a linear combination of consumers and resources. It just, just so happens that for the typical models people write down, most of the fast eigenvalues tend to be overlapping the resource eigenvectors, uh, or, you know, the, sorry, the, uh, the eigenvectors corresponding to the fast eigenvalues tend to overlap the um, resource vectors, if you like, the resource directions, but they don't have to. And certainly, I think as you get further away from the equilibrium, it's you know, it's not obvious that slow manifold is just going to be well described by trajectory of the consumers alone. Uh, but I think there's some interesting open scope there to understand, uh, yeah, what happens far away from equilibrium where you simply can't just set dr by dt equal to zero. So yeah, so three ways to answer your question. One is rarely you might have enough algebraic equations to eliminate resources. In that case, and there's, there's one at least very simple example where that's true and sort of plausible with one consumer, but going to be rarer in general. Two, you can kind of say if you're near equilibrium and the spectrum looks the right way, you can more or less ignore the resource dynamics. If you're further away from equilibrium, I think it's plausible that there may be still separations in time scales, but it's much harder to get a handle on exactly, um, you know, who is undergoing the interesting slower dynamics. That, does that great. answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. And thanks again for the nice talk. Okay, right, no problem. Great. There, are, um, there is a question from Ankit. Uh, hi. Ankit. Yeah, hi. A uh, very interesting set of lectures. Uh, so, like, based on this, what I could gather was uh, that, like, in such bacterial communities, since you also have this additional goods production, so to say, that sort of like brings down the competition. And like in general, uh, Lotka Volterra, we usually think of interaction matrices and like we directly write down competition terms for like between species. But here, like there's no direct sense of competition. Like it's through like mediated through resources and goods production. But like, yeah. is there any way of uh, like looking at different levels of competition, like maybe as a mixture of uh, resources and goods production, uh, which could give you like some limits to the stability of the system? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So yeah, you're absolutely right that it, I, I went from a picture where the interactions were pairwise, i.e. lock of Volterra, whether it was competition or you could write down mutualistic interactions by just changing the signs, right, in the inter-specific interactions. And I went from there directly to a, a system where uh, it was consumption and production of resources. Uh, but so a couple of points about that that I would I would make. One is uh, if you go back, I mean, and not that it's not intuitive anyway, but it's certainly if you even go back to the Locke Volterra papers on competition, the interpretation was often written down in terms of resources, right? That these uh, competition coefficients would be large if there was a substantial overlap in the kinds of resources that two species use. So, so I think, so what I'm getting at is, yeah, the competition becomes indirect. There's no direct competition anymore in the consumer resource models, and there's no direct pairwise mutualistic interaction. It's mediated by, I'm producing something that you can use. So it is indirect, but that interpretation was probably always underlying even those pairwise models. You know, so from a certain point of view, people probably thought about those pairwise models and still do as an approximation to a more indirect process. That would be one interpretation. But let, let me answer your question in a different way as well. And that is, 
at least in principle, and probably you know you you can identify cases in practice where competition. Well, when I teach competition in 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 a class, you do have different kinds of competition, and some, and so the classically you might separate out into some which look more like resource overlap, and some which do look more like direct interactions between individuals, right? And it could be a territorial interaction or something like this. So now ultimately those are probably for competition for resources. So territory would be what an example, right? But nevertheless, it could play out in terms of more direct pairwise interactions between individuals. So in other words, that there is a difference potentially in the dynamics of we're in the same location and I happen to get forage for something before you do. There's a difference between that and me kind of pushing you out, right? So. So I think it's a great question that you could easily imagine layering on top of the consumer resource models that I wrote down and that other people obviously work on as well. You could layer on top of that a direct interaction. There'll be no reason not to. And, and you're right also that it would like it would certainly change the dynamics and, 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 and very probably the stability properties. So I think there's no reason not to do that. And there are probably many situations where species are competing both indirectly for resources and maybe directly in terms of um, you know direct pairwise interaction. So so I guess what I'm saying is one interpretation, lock of Volterra competition really is just an approximation to resource acquisition. But another interpretation as well, it maybe really accounts for those direct pairwise cases where two individuals really are interacting directly with each other. And um, I don't think there's any reason not to put the two together. I have I have not done that but it would be kind of interesting to see what the outcome would be. Interesting, thanks. Great, there is a, a question from Pablo, please. Hi Pablo. Hello James, um, thank you for your lectures. They were really interesting. So my question Great. is um, related to the one that Washington had. Um, I'm working with the Marsland model, which you probably are familiar with um, and Random matrix theory is really interesting, but it has one problem that if you're not able to um, analytically find the equilibrium, you can't do anything. Um, and this is the problem with the Marshland model. Even if I do um, time scale separation and I assume that mm. resource dynamics are fast, um, I'm not able to find a, a, a stable solution for the resources. And therefore, I'm not able to find an analytical solution for the equilibrium of the populations. Uh, so I was wondering if you have faced this problem, because I see that you've done random matrix theory with consumer resource model where you have uh, cross-feeding. Um, and what, what are the type of assumptions, uh, that if you can detail that, that you do in order for you to, to get analytical um, equilibrium? Or if you have faced this problem in this particular model, uh, do you have any ideas on how to tackle it? Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, thanks for the question, Pablo. A uh, couple, of, couple of points. So. Um, to the extent I use random matrix theory in these models related to Washington's question, it's to provide examples rather than a necessary element. In other words, you know, just, just to give a, a numerical examples, in, in some cases we chose that consumer, the consu consumer preferences were um, you know, drawn from a random distribution, drawn, drawn from a distribution. Uh, but now let me also th point out that um, a couple of things. One is, uh, so the um, Robert Marsland and collaborators, of course, the, the model that they have developed, which is in, it's sort of very similar to the most general model I wrote down of production in one of my slides. And then I simplified to a different model, which um, is maybe a little bit easier to analyze in some respects, but the, the more general model allows for the production of resources by me to depend on the resources that are available to me. And that's very plausible. And it's, it's probably the, the right way to, well, <laughs> I'm giving myself a lot of parentheses here to get back to. Let me just say for production of resources as a byproduct of metabolism to depend on the resources around me makes total sense, right? Because if I eat burgers, maybe my byproducts are different than if I eat, um, apples and pears, right? So that, that, that makes total sense. And, but it adds an extra layer of you know, difficulty in analyzing those models. So um, 
uh, the, the way that we formulated production of resources is probably more easily interpreted as a kind of recycling process. So following mortality, that there's some characteristic composition of a cell of each taxon, and some of it is returned to the common pool. So there are differences. I guess that's my main point in saying uh, that, that describing those um, details of, the, of Robert Marsland's model and what I talked about in detail. But I also totally buy that allowing to make allowing for production to be more generally dependent on the resources around me makes sense. So um, in terms of analytical solutions of the model I presented, they're relatively straightforward, just involve kind of matrix inversions and nothing, nothing overly complicated. That may become more complicated. The, the, the more um, involved you make the production term for sure so that there's no guarantee right there's no guarantee that you're going to always be able to even so i mean you you have algebraic equations right if you're looking for equilibria so they're certainly simpler than solving the dynamics but there's no guarantee you'll have a nice form or, or and certainly there's no guarantee of having a stable equilibrium so i wonder i don't know this for sure but certainly in in the models that we have looked at and that i talked about there are certainly regimes in which you won't find the resources settling to an equilibrium. These are precisely the cases where there are instabilities, right? So I don't know if that is relate, related to what you're seeing. And the stability properties of the Marsden model are, are different in some respects. So it depends on the details of how you're implementing that. But certainly what we find is that there are regimes of resource inflow and obviously depending on the structure of the consumer preferences and the production of resources, there are regimes where there won't be a stable positive equilibrium. And so if you were to solve those equations numerically, which we did just to show what it looks like, you get some kind of limit cycle and it doesn't, it's not, yeah, that's something which I, you know, I don't understand fully the properties of what does happen to the dynamics when those equilibria become unstable. But um, yeah, in, in our models, what seems to be key is the level of resource inflow for determining that. And so there are some regimes of resource inflow in, coupled to the you know the structure of the the preferences and the production matrix there are some regimes where you won't find stable solutions and some where you will so i don't know if that's what's maybe happening in in the solutions you're looking at that there actually isn't a positive stable equilibrium it could be that or um you know maybe it's just hard to, to put to find uh, your solution in a nice form uh and what, one other point i wanted to make was in the second lecture of mine that 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 uh, that um, is part of the school. Uh, I talked about uh, what we called uh, metabolically informed community dynamics, and there, you know, what I was really trying to get at. It was a paper with Mario Muscarella, who who was in my lab at the time. What we were trying to get at was, okay, we do know that the production of resources is going to often depend on the resources I take up. The, the, the point I'm making about the Mars and model being a bit different from the, what I, I talked about in lecture one. But, um, but what should that look like? You know, I think there's a bit of guesswork involved in formulating these consumer resource models. And that goes back also to a point that came up in response to Washington's question. It, it, you have many more choices to make. There are these different flavors of consumer resource and production models. And so what I wanted to get at in that second lecture was, okay, can we, um, can we narrow down the possibilities? Can we understand whether there are, you, you, you know, what, what is, what are the most plausible ways for production of resources that depend on uh, the resources I'm taking up? Uh, you know, cause you could write down, you know, you could write down more and less plausible functions, but it, I mean, there's nothing really uh, stopping you from writing down some arbitrary horrible function of uh, resources and um, you know how, and different metabolic pathways and and that that could be very plausible even if it's horrific right and so that that was the idea of that second talk and that paper was to begin to think about um, what uh, yeah, what are the most plausible can we from something like first principles derive what those production um, matrices should look like or could look like uh, or constrain what they could look like. So um, yeah, maybe part of what you're seeing is just that there's many ways to formulate these resource consumption and production models. They're not all guaranteed to have nice closed form solutions for sure for the equilibria, 
they're not all guaranteed in it well in any of the ones we've looked at to have stable positive equilibria and the uh to cap it all you know we we don't really know exactly what the right formulation of these models is so there's a lot of question marks there so i'm really answering your question with a bunch of questions but hopefully that's at least adjacent to what you're you're thinking about thank you i think it was a very nice set of questions as an answer uh, <laughs> there is a question by martina Hi, Martina. Hello, James. Um, so I, I have a question that is related to what you were saying just three seconds ago. So how do you think you, so these metabolic informed models, how do you think they scale when you add more resources that you produce? Uh, and whether you can, I don't know, uh, make the what you produce changing in time depending on whether you are in the exponential phase the lag phase so uh yeah i mean yeah yeah basically <laughs> does does it yeah that's, I, I think i get the question but uh, and it, but if i didn't re-ask it again if i'm answering totally the wrong thing um so that metabolically informed model it's a really simple model of what's happening inside a cell, right? That's that's kind of, I think, what you're getting at. It's just uh, two, yeah, or I guess three resources involved, basically, in, in each intracellular process. So two things coming in, an interaction between them, and something comes out at the end, and then that's excreted by the cell. So uh, how does that scale when you have more resources involved? And so let, let me... Say back to you how I'm uh, understanding the question and maybe I'll give you a chance just to say if I'm on the right lines. So I think you're asking, well, in any real cell, the, the processes are more complicated. They, they will involve um, discrete changes, like maybe processes being switched on and switched off in response to what cells are sensing externally. And so there could be, you know, the, these, it could be a lag phase or something like this, or yeah, as a, as a cell switches between resources. Um, there could also be many different, uh, well, there will be many different resources and other molecules involved in these processes inside the cell. I think you're asking how much of what we see in that really simplified model could possibly carry over in that more general picture. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, actually I was thinking uh, more about what happens in the cell uh, which is related to what happens in the cell, but is, uh, so you start from glucose, but you produce 30 other metabolites and yeah. more or less the cell excretes, I don't know, 20 of them, uh, because you have uh, the uh, metabolic overflow or you have uh, all these molecules are, can diffuse passively outside uh, the membrane. So the question was, okay, if I start from glucose, do you think you can scale uh, your processes to account for, I don't know, more metabolites that, that are produced. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe, uh, yeah, that's that's, yeah, the big... that's a great, great question. And that's an easier question to answer because the answer is yes, I think that that, that side of things is much easier to scale, right? That, okay. that, that, um, that they, you know, that there may be different, you know, obviously ratios or proportions of those metabolites produced, but the functional forms will be pretty similar. So scaling on that side is pretty nice. If there's you know, many, many outputs and they can diffuse passively across the cell wall and then are put into the common pool. That, that works nicely in that same framework and will look very similar. I mean, but like you say, I know this is relevant to your work as well. Um, the, uh, that, that will make a big difference to the community dynamics for sure. And you're right. And, and of course, to make the full contact with what I talked about in the first lecture where you have many consumers and many resources, that's certainly one way to get there, one plausible way to get there with the metabolically informed model is to have these multiple metabolites produced. And that could lead to a really rich set of community dynamics. And we didn't really get there in that, in that first paper with Mario. You know, so that's an interesting, there's scope for interesting development there. For example, to say, if you have uh, those, maybe um, you keep the input, the, the, the essential resources relatively simple for each taxon, but you have a wide range of outputs, but following the kinds of functional forms that we, we, we talked about. Uh, I, 
it would be really interesting to understand what that changes about the dynamics and the stability and the equilibria and so on. I think that would be really interesting as a comparison with all the stuff in the first lecture. We haven't just haven't got there yet. It's, you know, 2020 happened basically. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question and it is easier to tackle than the other way around. Now, the other way around would be you know, if you, if there are many kind of like essential resources that get involved in some, you know, some way in the overall set of pathways that lead to those many metabolites. I think that's a, that's not uh, an impossible question to answer. That's the scaling up of that side, but it's but it at least is harder. And a, a question to me that I don't really have a good handle on is how to systematically uh, pare down the you know the true complexity of that metabolism and, and, and to, to a point where you can say these results are robust. I don't think it's implausible that, I mean, look, ecologists have been looking at these relatively simplified dynamics this whole time, right, for decades. So we've been had this guesswork about how the internals of not just uh, single celled organisms, but uh, more, uh, but multicellular, more complex organisms, how the internals affect um, ecological dynamics, right? Behavior, it would be, uh, it, you know, maybe underexplored in terms of its impact on population and, and community dynamics, but certainly is something people think about a lot. So guess what I'm saying? It's, it's not implausible to me that those internal dynamics can boil down to something manageable, but also we have not at all proved that in, in that paper. But the other way around, producing many outputs, I think is, 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 is much more doable. And, and and, and not at all uninteresting. It would be very interesting to see how that affects stability and dynamics for larger communities. One, one more thing I wanted to say, sorry if I'm just taking an opportunity to ramble, uh, but uh, you, your question is interesting and it's about this, again, additional layer of mechanism inside the cell. And I think it's just a super interesting question because it's not just about throwing more resources in and having more resources come out. It, I think it's also about, um, you know, what is that, you know, there may be other elements of the set of rules, but obviously there are other elements to the set of rules by which cells are operating. And how do we pare those down to the, you know, to, to at least uh, a simple enough model that we can extract robust results for the community dynamics. So I think, um, I've se so I've seen a few other, you know, few other approaches to thinking about that um you know there's like there's papers from terry Hua's group which go back many years um looking at uh, apportionment of resources inside the cell to different categories of process that's an in my mind it's it's conceptually similar it's a way of you know a simplified model of the internals of the cell which then can give rise to different community dynamics at the you know at this larger scale and the, the cell wall of course kind of provides you this so, somewhat a natural separation of scales which is interesting um so yeah i think it's just an it, the answer to your question is i think some of it can be scaled up the more general answer in my mind is is another question which is how do we systematically um show what kinds of community dynamics are robust or the most likely outcomes of whatever is going on in the cell. And that's, that's a, that's a harder question, but I think it's super interesting. Thank you. Thanks for the um, answer. Uh, so is there any other uh, question? I don't see any, any um, hand raised in the, uh, in the list, but please, uh, we have time for more uh, questions and answers. Um, or if you want, don't want to uh, talk, you can uh, type it in the chat. So it has been pretty intense so far. So, uh, ah, there is another question from Washington. Please yeah, Washington. if no one else is asking questions, I'll ask another one. Yes. Um, so have you or when you, when you think about resources, I gather you're primarily thinking about like physiological resources, like material resources, like phosphate and things like that. Um, have you thought about how energy as a resource fits into that? Or do you, are you aware of other work where people have looked at sort of energy flow in systems like this? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, 
yeah there there are there are papers so, and approaches to thinking about uh, communities or maybe more ecosystem dynamics in terms of energy flows and you know, thermodynamic properties more generally of ecological communities. There is a whole, um, you know, not, not field, but like a approach of thinking about, um, I, I don't know if, if you are familiar with the, in non-equilibrium system mechanics, but people have proposed maximizing entropy as a principle, not proven, but just as a, maybe mm -hmm. as a guideline. So there's, there's definitely people thinking about whether ecological systems change over time in order to maximize entropy production. And so, you know, obviously that's not just the energy, but it's sort of thinking about the system more thermodynamically, maybe, which is along, maybe along the lines of what you're, you're wondering. Um, I don't know if, if, I mean, for the kinds of things we're looking at here, I mean, the, the resources, I guess that it, I can't think of a way they would not have an energetic value as such. I think all the things we're thinking about, whether that's light capture or it's, um, you know, eating glucose and kind of uh, using that to derive energy. I mean, they're all, energy I think is inevitably involved, obviously, um, but... Good, you're saying that some of the resources being passed include energy as a component and others contain other crucial nutrients and things. So it's, 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 it's in some sense implicit, in some sense implicit in what you're doing that energy would be one of the features involved. But that's right, that's right. I'm and I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, I like the, the, the work I just referenced, you know, just thinking about these, these sort of, if you like, coarser grained pictures of how ecosystems are working and the flows of energy and other thermodynamic properties. So I'm not saying I don't like that stuff and I'm interested in it, but it will be, you know, part of what we're thinking about here is what happens as a level of, for example, um, as, uh, so you could imagine that the substitutable resources may be all uh, forms of organic carbon, you know, and so there are some other, you know, resources which are less uh, energetically useful, which may be essential, but we could sort of ignore those and just say, well, carbon is sort of the limiting resource in a given context, maybe. Uh, and so then, you know, what we're interested in here comes down to more exactly looking at the differences between those different forms of energy, if you like. So mm -hmm. calling those, you know, collapsing down that matrix to uh, to just energy could be kind of reductive, right? Because you wouldn't. So, for example, many of the uh, not many, but several of the talks in the school I've thought about, and the, and and mine too, in a way, think about coexistence, right, of many different kinds of species. So, uh, not that that entirely relies on differentiation of resource use, but it, it can do, right? And so mm -hmm. you'd sort of lose that. You know, and, and, but which is fine for depending on the question, right? Because you've actually maybe you want to lump all heterotrophs into a category, right? And then you're thinking about a much bigger cycle of just you know, autotrophs, heterotrophs, de decomposes, or something like something like this. And in that case, those kind of coarser flows of energy might be the right language to use. But maybe, maybe the right way to answer your question is it, it probably just depends on the question of interest. And if your question of interest is understanding communities of many different species doing slightly different things, you know, but kind of at the large scale, kind of maybe they're doing slightly different things in sort of boring, boringly, right? They're not vastly mm -hmm. different. Then, uh, you know, the, the language of the, these kinds of resources is probably the right language. But if you're interested in those sort of larger scale flows of uh, energy and, and, you know, you might think about just flows of nutrients like C and N and P rather than specific forms of them. Yeah, then that, that would be a sort of different language to use maybe for different kinds of questions. Cool, thanks. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, James. So we have space for more questions if uh, anyone wants to ask. Really good questions, by the way. Thanks everyone for, yes. the, for, for watching the lectures and for the great questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I mean, it was very, very interesting. Um, so if uh, there are no more questions, what I would say is that we can uh, move to the uh, breakout rooms and James can stay, uh, let's say, other 15 minutes with us. And uh, you, you are free to chat uh, informally in the breakout rooms. 
I just as a technical reminder, if you have a Zoom version that is five or higher, you can also change the breakout rooms. So you will be randomly assigned, but uh, you can of course flock uh, in the breakout room where James is if you want to chat with him. So uh, with that, thanks a lot, James, very much for uh, recording the lectures and staying with us for this Q&A. Uh, we'll be back uh, in these main uh, meeting rooms in half an hour with the lecture by Mercedes Pasquale. Awesome. Thank you for coming and enjoy the lecture by, uh, by Mercedes. I'm sure it'll be super good. Okay. okay. Thank you.